Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to our panel. We are retroblasting. My name is Michael French. This is Melinda Mock and Joe Demons. We've run a web channel since May of 2012, and we focus on the 70s, 80s, and early 90s uh, when it comes to pop culture, cartoons, toys, and we try and make videos that sort of deconstruct some of the cartoons, point out what's cool, point out what's a little weird. Um, we call a spade a spade. Uh, and our, our policy is pretty much that we'll talk about anything up through Batman the Animated Series, and then after that you've really got to convince us why we need to talk about that <laughs> property, whatever it is. Um, but uh, we are uh, we're costumers and comic book fans and, and toy fans like everybody that comes to events like this. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, and we just decided that since I have a film background and, and we all sort of have sort of an entertainment pop culture background, we should start a web channel because there was a lot of content out there, but it all kind of seemed the same. And so we thought, well, you know what? There's a lot of interesting discussions going on, on on message boards and forums. Why aren't those discussions actually being had on YouTube as well? So we thought we'd kind of bring that element to YouTube. Uh, we're collectors, just like probably a lot of you in this room. We kind of focus on vintage. Uh, for example, Joe is the resident Transformers, Centurion, Superpowers, Roboforce guy, uh, and uh, Melinda's naturally My Little Pony, and uh, she also loves Voltron and uh, Blackstar. And uh, I tend to just and, be the... And Rambo. And Rambo. Oh yeah, she loves Rambo. Yes. Yeah. And I just tend to be sort of the uh, random uh, bordering on hoarder kind of person <laughs> that collects everything. The catch-all. Uh, we also restore toys. So. Uh, we run a web series about restoring toys, whether it's completely disassembling a vintage Millennium Falcon and putting it back together step by step, or whether it's just cleaning something up. In the lower right photo, you'll see Joe and I and Kirby, the cat. <laughs> the retro uh, cat. We are, we are disassembling and re repairing a Kenner Michael Knight Knight Rider 2000 car. Uh, we discovered trying to get the voice box to work where, you know, when you press the uh, license plate holder, it says, greetings, Michael. You know, that is actually a physical record player in the toy. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that these toys are already 35 years old and that the technology has gotten that far. We're so used to chips and, you know, digital and things like that. And you look at it and you go, wow, that was a record player powered by a rubber band. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what makes a playset great? I want to let Melinda kind of tackle this because she, she gave us a lot of thought. Yeah, I think there's there's kind of three main things that make a playset really great. Thanks. I feel like I'm right up on the mic. <laughs> the first one is size, because we all know size is really important. And um, features, so meaning like how many cool, is, is it just a shell, or does it have like a lot of features that interact with your, your things? And then um, sort of the other catch-all is the design and playability. So do the figures actually fit onto the, the playset? Um, do, do, is there a mechanism for getting figures from the bottom floor to the top floor if it's got to, you know, or do they just levitate up there, you know? So things like that um, that, that show a little bit more thought being put into the design of the playset. So I wanted to ask you all a question. Do you consider this a playset or a vehicle? Raise your hands if you think it's a playset. Vehicle. Oh, Some people okay. are undecided. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All of the above. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of a question because you can pick it up if you were a kid. You could pick it up if you grab you know, your hands around it. You could fly it around. But it also is considered on the box a playset because it has an interior and it has all these, these features in it. All right. What about this? Is this a playset or is it just a toy? Well, how many think it's just a, just a standalone toy? Gambit does. Doctor Doctor Who does. Does. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, what about people who say it's a playset? Uh, okay. It depends on the transformation mode. It does. <laughs> it can be both. That's, That's the, the beauty of Transformers. Answer. This is, of course, Fortress Maximus from the uh, G1 GI Joe. Uh, I'm so sorry. G1 Transformers line. I was doing G's and it just kind of rolled. <laughs> um, so. Melinda, do you want to tackle well, this? Well, yeah, just briefly to kind of look at um, play sets over, over time started sort of in like World War II and, and in that time period in the 50s um, with marks. And they were mostly these sort of cardboard play sets. And they had the little nondescript um, little men that would go in there. And you could have all sorts of things. You have little army men. You had like barnyards and, and western, and forts, western and, yeah. things and forts. And so they were, I think, primarily marketed to little boys and to kind of play, you know, cowboys and Indians and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and then in the 70s, they kind of got smart and they started putting in um, licensed properties. You could play with 
um, more than just the little army men. You, you could have, you know, actual characters. And, uh, but they were still fairly rudimentary. They were either cardboard, and then in the 70s, they sort of did the vacuum, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the plastic play sets. Yeah, and this was also at a time when they were finally separating the figures from the play sets, because from before, it was like you'd get a play set, and it would come with a bevy of, of uh, non-articulated sort of sculptured little army men or Western people or whatever. And now what they're saying is, you know, collect them all. The mentality was coming in where it's like, you can buy the play set separately and then buy the figures you want to interact with that play set. Uh, and the funny thing about the Mego play sets from back then uh, is that not only were they um, sort of like uh, cardboard that had printed details on it that was then wrapped in the same thing that a trapper keeper is wrapped in, it was kind of that clear plastic, uh, but then they would uh, recycle those play sets a little bit. So for example, the, the Mego Bat Cave was also the Planet of the Apes planet uh, at one point. Uh, so you can find it in different configurations with slightly different art. Then 1977 hit, and we got a movie that I don't know if many of you heard of called Star Wars. Um, and at this point, Kenner Toys decided they were really going to change up the game. And uh, they were still having uh, some difficulty, as you can see from these play sets here, stepping out of the 70s. The Cantina Adventure set, the Creature Cantina, less so about the Droid Factory, but the Land of the Jawas, these were all play sets that either had some cardboard or were all cardboard. Uh, they, had, they were still in that 70s mode, they were still evolving, but then Kenner dropped this one on us. The Death Star Space Station, all plastic with only two detail pieces that were, that were cardboard and weren't essential to the function of the place itself. Um, this was the real game changer. This is when Kenner started to leave every other toy company behind, and all the other toy companies either started racing to catch up or failed. And as you'll see on the next slide, one of the big ones that we just mentioned wasn't able to keep up. One thing I do want to point out about this is it's really cool. It, it does address a lot of the things I talked about in terms of, first of all, it's really big. Second of all, there is um, a mechanism in order to get uh, characters from point A to point B, um, like there's the elevator. And then there are a lot of actual separate features, so you can use it for a lot of play scenarios if you're you know, actually playing with your toys. So I think it's really great, especially since it's the first one that's sort of taking us into a more modern era. So the late 70s competition was lagging behind Kenner's Death Star. Um, Mego, which had the license for Buck Rogers and uh, a number of other television properties, uh, just wasn't able to uh, sort of rethink the marketplace. Uh, on the right, you can see the now rare, and um, it was clearance aisle for a long time back then, the Star Trek The Motion Picture Enterprise Bridge playset. Well, as we all know, that movie's nicknamed the motionless picture because it's rather boring in places to most audiences. Um, the playset itself, do you guys know what, they're not so much sold now, but especially in the 80s and into the 90s, when you'd go to Target and Walmart during the uh, holiday season, you could buy cheap ornaments that were made out of, for your, like, like for your door, that were made out of sort of a vacuum form, blow molded plastic, that, like a wreath that would hang on your, your wall, but it was like a plastic sculpture of a, of a, of a wreath. Well, when you flipped it over, it was that thin plastic that you could kind of rip in half with your fingers. That's what that's made out of. It's not made out of anything durable. So these things just fell apart. Um, and people walked up to the toy aisle and they, they saw the Death Star and that. <laughs> what are you gonna buy? So let's go back to the 80s because this is where things really get interesting. 1980 to 82 was the explosion of, of toy properties trying to uh, compete with Star Wars and really get out there into the marketplace. Uh, the first one on the upper left is the very rare uh, Cobra Command missile uh, headquarters that was an all cardboard playset that Hasbro tried to get out into the market as a, uh, a department store exclusive to get G.I. Joe uh, into the game. Uh, that, that place is really rare now because not only was it cardboard and the dog ate it three weeks after he bought it, but it was the first one and it was, uh, it was uh, lower distribu distribution. On the bottom, of course, is the famous Barbie Dream House, which is massive and still worth a lot of money today because how many pieces it came with. Um, and every little girl wanted one. Like, even if you didn't love Barbie, you just, it was like a status symbol. And I never had one, but I mean, it was awesome. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of the ones I want to mention uh, is that blue castle uh, on, the, on the bottom uh, row. Does anyone remember Chris Star? Right. Uh, does anyone watch Robot Chicken? 
Okay, does anyone remember an episode where uh, these two meth heads are in uh, encounter this crystal dude and they smash him with a baseball bat and smoke him? <laughs> That's Kristar. Uh, he actually had a crystal castle, which is very rare now because Kristar as a toy line from Remco didn't last very long, but it's actually a very cool playset, and if you can track one down, it's serious money. Uh, but of course, I think everybody knows the playset on the lower left, second from the, second from the left. Uh, the famous Castle Grayskull from Masters of the Universe. Uh, this playset uh, really was the first one that could compete with the Death Star as far as uh, popularity. This playset was still in Christmas catalogs in 1986. I mean, they, they just kept selling this thing. I don't even know how the mold survived to keep pumping these out. Now, we keep breaking out Star Wars because Star Wars, not because we're super fans of Star Wars, which we are, but it's, it's also because those toys um, all came out in sort of gluts. It was like when the movie came out, new play sets came out. And as you can see, Kenner is sort of starting to understand where they need to go, but inexplicably for this movie, and even till now, they have never made a major Empire Strikes Back one setup play set like the Death Star. Uh, they never made a Cloud City play set, they never have. Uh, and as you can see from some of these playsets, they're still holding on to cardboard a little bit. Three out of the six playsets are now all plastic. Dagobah, the Imperial attack base, which is odd because if I recall the Battle of Hoth correctly, it was the rebels that were in trenches, not the Imperials, but whatever. Um, and then the, the other three are um, partially cardboard. Some of them are, these two right here are recycled from the land of the Jawas. And then the one in the middle was a JCPenney or Sears exclusive. Uh, and that was the only Cloud City we got. It was all cardboard. And it was slot A into tab B and hope that your father doesn't step on it on Christmas morning. I mean, it, it, it's really shocking to see how low tech this was. And also, I love the fact that the stormtroopers are permanently printed on the background. So <laughs> you're never alone when you're playing with that playset. I think it's really interesting that it's clear that they are looking at the economy of making the play sets. They don't want to invest too much in case they don't sell, which is the opposite of how it's going to get, as we'll see as we progress into the 80s, because at that point it's like, make it huge, which is the motto of the 80s. So. I wanted to mention briefly the Kenner attempt to merchandise Raiders of the Lost Ark, and they did a great play set for the Well of Souls. Uh, it wasn't very large. It came in a box about one foot square. Uh, but the, the cool thing about it was that it was very accurate to the set from the movie, aside from not having the huge Anubis statues. Other than that, it was extremely accurate. Unfortunately, uh, it plagues the Indiana Jones toys to this day. They don't ever last very long. And I think that has something to do with the fact that those toys are always so very film specific to the events that happen in those movies. And so kids don't really feel compelled to widen the imaginary scope of it. They're more interested in going out into space with starfighters or, or into fantasy worlds. So. 1983, this is where things really start to pick up. Um, some of these are kind of funny because they were really trying to just capitalize uh, on, on the, the toy boom that was happening. My, my favorite here, just for laughs, is the 18 Command Center. Because if I recall the show correctly, they were a nomadic group of guys that traveled around in a van. So I don't really know why they need a headquarters, but I guess that's cool. It seems uh, like they could have done a Millennium Falcon style giant A team van yeah. with like all kinds of features or something. That would have been awesome. Yeah, that would have been Shut neat. Up and take but my money. I they, know, uh, right? Galoob, Galoob also made the ugliest action figures ever with the A team <laughs> characters. They look like they have mom jeans with big front butt. Like they're just, they're really <laughs> ugly. Um, but uh, the one on the top, top center is the uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons toy lines, Fortress of Fangs, which is a really cool place that I would almost, I wish I'd had that as a kid because that would have been the Temple of Doom. I would have gotten Indiana Jones involved in that one. Um, the Black Star Ice Castle was a direct attempt to compete with the uh, Castle Grayskull. And unfortunately, it was a molded piece of plastic that if you find one now, they're worth a lot of money. And I'd say 50% of the time, you better tell that eBay seller to pack it you know, in the most amazing box ever, because otherwise it will shatter. Pay extra for shipping, insure it, and um, yeah. they shatter like really glass, it up. just bam. Um, we wanted to put this one in here. Melinda found this. We didn't even know this existed. I actually didn't know that this existed. I know there's not a lot of girls in the audience, but um, Strawberry Shortcake had a house, apparently, which I didn't even know back then. I wish I had, because it was. It looks awesome, but it's huge. Like, the thing is, like, enormous. And I'm just, 
I'm sitting here going, wow, look at all the, there's all these tiny little features. They have a tiny little bathtub and a tiny little bath mat. And there's, there's, there's so many pieces, parts, I can't imagine getting one that has all the parts at this point. I can't imagine that it would be probably over $1,000. It, it even has an attic to hide the bodies. <laughs> true. Uh, the one on the, the, the lower left is the one, though, that I think we really all want to talk about, and that's the G.I. Joe uh, headquarters. From 1983. Uh, Hasbro did not wait long after the Cobra playset to get into the game with a, a, a larger playset, all plastic. Um, the funny thing about this playset is I always wondered as a kid why there was this huge cannon on the front that they're supposed to man in the event of an attack, but uh, it has no protective roof or canopy for the person manning it. There's like a cockpit seat that the person's in, and I'm thinking, that seems to be a very dangerous place to sit. We just always thought that was really odd to have these very realistically inspired military vehicles for this G.I. Joe line early on, and the sort of realistically inspired characters early on with the green camo, but to have this base that has this very strange death seat up there. It's like the Widowmaker chair. Uh, 1983, we get Return of the Jedi, and this is actually a rather disappointing turn of events for, for, for Kenner. Uh, the, the Ewok Village was the one I had as a child, Christmas 83. It looks like three trees after a hurricane. It doesn't look like a forest at all. Um, and it was the only real place that of any importance. The other two were recycled from the, uh, the droid factory. Yes, Return of the Jedi's line had the same playset twice, just recolored. Uh, and then the Jabba the Hutt action playset, I don't really see that as a playset so much as just a large action figure. Yes? Yeah. Robin, Robin Hood, Prince yes. of Thieves, yes. I'm really glad you brought that up, because in 1991, Kevin Costner's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves um, pushed its way into movie theaters, and uh, when it did, Kenner got the toy license for it, and they recycled a number of the toys from Everything. Return of the Jedi, and they actually improved the Ewok Village by giving it a tree canopy and all sorts of fun stuff, so if you collect Star Wars and you like the, the Forest of Endor, don't get this. Go get the uh, Sher Sherwood Forest playset from 1991. Which is typically much more affordable. It is much more affordable if you can find it, and it's still the same scale. Even though the Robin Hood figures were taller, they didn't scale the playset up. So it's still like Star Wars size. It's awesome. All right, 1984. I want Joe to kind of take the first one up here on the left, the Hall of Justice, because he is our superpowers resident genius. Well, as we all remember from the Super Friends cartoons, um, the Hall of Justice was, you know, it was set in every show. Every, every cartoon had a meanwhile at the Hall of Justice. Um, so as you're collecting these superheroes, the one thing that you want to have is the Hall of Justice, because this is where everybody convenes. This is where they, they coordinate, you know, what's going on with the Legion of Doom. Um, it had some really great features. It had the helipad, so if you were lucky enough to have the Batcopter, you could land the Batcopter on top. It had... Uh, transportation pods, it had a, uh, a cell, a holding cell for you to put all of your, your villains in. Um, it was a really great place that it was, it was fun to have. And then the big fumble was is that Mattel tried to compete with the Secret Wars and they brought out the Tower of Doom which is on the lower right. It sucks. <laughs> it's just a tower of plastic. You can still get them boxed mint for like $40 today. It's crazy. Um, but the, the one on the lower left is the, another one I think we all know, and if we don't, uh, I understand why, because it looks like a uh, background scenery of a Disney ride, um, but it's actually the Masters of the Universe Snake Mountain playset. It's supposed to be Skeletor's Sanctum. It doesn't look anything like the one in the show. We did a, um, a video review of this on our, on our web channel, and we got all this flack after we did it because we didn't show the backside of the playset. Not is the, for very long. Either. Yeah, not for very long. This is the front. Um, the reason we didn't show the backside was because there was nothing to talk about. It's one of the few playsets that was for a high profile line where there's nothing going on back there. But then in 1985, playsets got huge. Uh, this is the legendary USS Flag aircraft carrier playset from Hasbro for G.I. Joe. Um, it's legendary because it's big, but does that mean it's really great? Uh, the reason I ask this question is if you study this photo carefully, you'll notice that the kids in the photograph are playing with everything but the aircraft carrier. <laughs> <laughs> and nowadays, it really amounts to a $2,000 toy table. If you can find one complete, it's about $2,000 or more. And uh, all you really do is set all your other toys on it. So I could go to Ikea and do a lot better with glass and internal lighting. I don't know about you. Uh, it is impressive because it is 
taller. It's taller than, if you just stood it upright, it's taller than me and I'm 6'3". I mean, the thing is just massive. It's an amazing, it's an amazing playset. Um, but it does beg the question, what constitutes a great playset? Is it size purely? Um, so. Yeah, so this sort of just represents the decadence of the 80s, kind of the apex of this. And there's a lot of other playsets that came out this year as well. Yeah, so 1985 had a, had a really uh, eclectic year of playsets. Um, the Wheeled Warriors Battle Base was a smaller one, but it was really cool because it was actually sort of a maintenance depot for the vehicles that you bought that were interchangeable. Uh, so you could sort of have this huge rolling garage that all your vehicles could go into, and it would also act like a carrying case for the heroes. Uh, the one on the lower right is uh, the Hive Action playset from Sectars. Um, this one was from Coleco. Uh, Coleco would then the next year go on to design uh, the Rambo toy series. Um, the funny thing about the Hive is it's so big and it incorporated hand puppets. So these hand puppets would come out of the, you put these hand puppets on that look like spiders and they you could come out of these cave holes and grab the action figures. There's a great website called um, X Entertainment about Generation X and the guy talks about the Hive playset and he, he bought one off eBay, mint in the box, and then he opened it up and assembled it on his kitchen counter. And he describes how it seems like every time he comes back into the room, it's gotten bigger when he hasn't been watching. <laughs> um, and then the one on the lower left we had to bring up because this is a holy grail of action figure play sets. Who in here is a Robotech fan? Right. This is actually the Matchbox Company's uh, action figure scale SDF-1 Macross Bridge play set. And this thing is super rare now. You'll, I, I wish I had one. Um, but it, it just shows you that every toy line was trying to get on the, on the play sets thing at some point. And up in the top is the uh, My Little Pony Paradise Estate. And my point in showing that is really um, most girls' play sets in the 80s and probably beyond the 80s uh, all just have a lot of furniture. I, I don't really understand why girls should enjoy playing with furniture or, you know, like you have your dolls and I, I always did really crazy scenarios with my dolls, like hostage situations and stuff, but like in the play sets it's really just a couch or a bed because I guess we're just super domestic creatures or something. Because horses, you know, they need couches. They do. <laughs> And we keep going into 85. We've got the Fright Zone uh, on the top left. We've got the Castle of Lions from Voltron, which is one of the best play sets they ever made. I mean, it is underrated as anything because a lot of people you know, didn't really collect Voltron in 85. It was more of an 84 thing, but the Panache Place Castle of Lions is, a, is amazing. You've got the Mask Boulder Hill play set on the top right, which turns into a fortress because that's what Mask is, illusion is the ultimate weapon. Uh, and then you have, uh, on the lower right, you've got the very goofy GoBots Command Center, which you can still get mint in the box for like $20. Like, they, they didn't sell. Uh, and then uh, you have the uh, mobile battle platform from G.I. Joe, which was a mid-range price point playset because they were smart enough to realize not everybody can afford the aircraft carrier, so we'll make an oil rig, and we'll put that <laughs> out there. Yeah, and She-Ra, uh, you know, obviously He-Man sort of evolved into She-Ra. Um, Again, furniture, there's a bed in there. I don't know why, you know, He-Man didn't seem to need a bed, but She-Ra certainly needed her beauty sleep, I guess. I don't know. It's kind and of- Skeletor bizarre. had the net hammock, though, so I mean. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> but he's kind of dainty. Yeah. 1986 happened to be the year of Ghostbusters because there were two shows that were competing for the, for the title. Uh, of course, you have Filmation, which licensed the name Ghostbusters to Columbia Pictures for the 1984 movie, but unfortunately, they forgot to secure uh, exclusive animation rights to anything adapted from the movie. Uh, so when Columbia Pictures decided to make the real Ghostbusters cartoon, not at that time called the real Ghostbusters, Filmation exercised its intellectual property rights to the name Ghostbusters and came out with a Ghostbusters cartoon based on their 1970s live action show, which was the odd one with the big gorilla, and yet the guy was named Jake Kong, but the gorilla was named Tracy. I, um, but what's really unfortunate about this is that Shaper, who made the toys for the Filmation Ghostbusters, made some amazing toys. I mean, the toys were truly accurate to the cartoon, but they are holy grails now, especially the, uh, the Tin Lizzie uh, car in the, in the garage and the playset itself. Those figures were almost six inches tall each, so imagine how big that playset has to be for that car to fit in that garage. It, it's, it's an amazing feat of, uh, of scale. And then the Ghostbusters Firehouse came out the same year for the real Ghostbusters show. Uh, and it, um, 
It's cool because it looks like the, the, the firehouse from, uh, from the movie, but it has some problems. It doesn't have an elevator to get from the first level to the second level. It doesn't have some of the logic things that, that we would like to have in our play sets. It's really just a big tower for you to park the car in, and it's actually too small for the car to actually park in. Uh, the car either has to hang off the back or you have to stick the front out through the doors. It's like, couldn't you just have added a few inches on either side to really integrate all this together? 1986, yeah, battle stations were big. Uh, I don't recall uh, Daniel-san and Mr. Miyagi getting attacked by ninjas in a dojo. That would have been awesome. <laughs> but they but now didn't. you can live it. Yes, now you can live it with the Remco Karate Kid uh, <laughs> training center. Uh, that's a rare play set now. Uh, the one in the middle is a holy grail. That's Eternia. And I wasn't aware, I watched every episode of Masters of the Universe. I never saw a monorail in Eternia <laughs> or a roller coaster. Yeah, it looks like a roller coaster. Yeah. It's like a roller coaster. I, I don't get it. Um, Fort Kyrian is the play set for Brave Star. And what was great about that was that the Brave Star figures were almost 12 inches tall. They were really, really big. That play set, the box for it is as big as a coffee table. And you set it up and it's like a full-size Main Street. You know, you could put a Gary Cooper in there and do High Noon. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, the, the Thundercats uh, layer on the lower left, that one was one of the first places to incorporate kind of the laser tag light features that they started to get really involved in when laser tag and photon came out. Uh, the one on the lower, the lower center is legendary. That's the, the G.I. Joe Terror Drone. Um, probably one of the best places it's ever made. It was the Cobra headquarters and it had an elevator uh, in, the, in, the, in the center with a multi-sectioned uh, dome door that would open up and would lower just like on a cartoon like G.I. Joe and then this fighter jet would come out of the center of it. I still wish I had that playset. <laughs> Jealous. Oh, and then Rambo, of course. This was a little disturbing because not only are we making a cartoon about Rambo, who's this violent guy with PTSD, but um, <laughs> they decide that the playset is going to look like a bamboo torture tower from a missing in action movie. <laughs> 1987, uh, that's when we get into the whole slime thing. Uh, we had it with it in 86 with uh, the real Ghostbusters and a little bit with, with uh, some other toy lines. But this 87 is really when uh, He-Man and then eventually Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles get really into the ooze and the slime. Um, you also have the power base from Captain Power, which is Mattel, and that's an extension of their Brave Star and their, um, not well, LJN did the, the Thundercats layer, but those also incorporated the laser light features so that you could use the, the, the sort of light guns to make things blow up and stuff on the play sets, which was pretty neat. Now, the one on the lower lower right, uh, we can mention the Mobile Command Center on the, on the top right, that's a G.I. Joe play set, sort of a large rolling tactical tank. Do you remember the Rolly kit? Uh, from the uh, made on TV commercials. It's like, roll the kit. You roll it out and then you put all your stuff in <laughs> yes. it. It's really cheesy. That's pretty much what the mobile command center is. If you look at it, it has two seams in the center. It opens like a tackle box and it's really fragile. So okay. you open it on three tiers and then it like shatters and crumbles because it's just <laughs> not very well made. Um, but this one is the, the, the Defiant shuttle. Legendary. Because look how big the kit is compared to the shuttle. I mean, I don't think he's taller than it. He just happens to be sitting, sitting, on, sitting on the ground. That's what G.I. Joe was good at, was the scale. But unfortunately, this was getting into the late 80s. And what did we already have coming down the pipeline, already in kids' homes everywhere? Dun 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 dun. We had the Nintendo. Super Mario Brothers, Duck Hunt, and all the games would follow. They were starting to pull market share away from toys. And so the industry wasn't going to be able to justify these larger play sets very, long, very much longer. Just a side note, the slime, we found some in our house, still still slimy, totally still slimy, and it's kind of stinky and gross. <laughs> 1988 to 89, uh, this is when Ninja Turtles really hit with the sewer play set on the top right, the Technodrome uh, on, the, uh, on the lower left. The cool thing about these is if you look at the Technodrome photograph, you see on the lower right of the play set, there's kind of a circular pipe attachment. That's because it can attach directly to the sewer play set. So you have one large place that after you get done, which is how you can justify it to your parents. Yeah. You're like, well, no, it's all one big toy. You just only got me half of it. Yeah. Uh, we really need that other part. Yeah, we, yeah, I want to get the other part. The Technodrome is harder to find than the sewer play set. Um, toy Biz made an attempt to license the Batman movie from, with Michael Keaton from 1989 and do a uh, Batcave. Uh, the collectability of this one is that it's unique and it was only out one year. Uh, 1990, Kenner, bought back the rights to Batman, and then they made their own movie line, and then 
proceeded from 1991 or 92's Batman Returns all the way through um, a toy line called Batman and Robin. They made a Wayne Manor Batcave playset that they recycled, I believe it was six times. It just has a different paint scheme. Batman Returns, Batman the Animated Series, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, Legends of the Batman, and, and Shadows of the Batman. You can find it pretty easily because of that. So when I say what are the top five biggest play sets, I mean literally size-wise. Any guesses on what's the biggest play set? It should be pretty obvious by now. Flag. Yeah, so we got the USS Flag. Um, and any other guesses on in the top five? Shout them out. Shuttle. Shuttle? Reliant. Defiant? Or Defiant. You would be correct. But actually the second largest play set is Eternia. Um, I guess that's counting in that roller coaster area. <laughs> Barbie Dreamhouse actually is really big because Barbies are quite large. The difference between the aircraft carrier and Eternia is so massive. Yes. yes. Well, it's pretty like much. Two and then it's like yeah. The size. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I wanted to represent this this way. I actually spent a lot of time going back through Christmas catalogs um, from the 80s. Um, to look at the actual dimensions of these play sets and put it in an Excel table, yes, I'm that much of a geek, um, <laughs> to generate this because it really, it's, it, it's worth showing visually how much bigger that play set is. Yeah, Go, do you want to uh, yeah, take this? Yeah, there, there's, there's the, the secret fourth element. We know we talked about the three elements of what makes a, a play set really great. And there's a secret fourth element, and that is nostalgia. So if this was the play set you had that you had the super fond memories of, this this uh, Ewok family hut, maybe you think that is the best play set. And you wouldn't be wrong, because for you, you've got those great memories attached to that. Um, so, you know, in terms of arguing about what the best play set is, you know, you can't really definitively say this is the best play set because everyone has their own experiences that they tie to these things. And that's why we still care about, that's why you guys are all here, is because you have something probably that you had when you were a kid that, you know, brings back those fond memories for you. So we're certainly not here to say you're wrong. It's just, you know, maybe think about it in a, in a broader scale too. Uh, we've been told that we are almost out of time, but I want to really thank everybody for coming to our panel today. Please keep in touch with us online. We really like interacting with everybody. Uh, we actually respond to emails. Like, we're not just trying to get followers. We actually want to interact and build a community of retro enthusiasts. So please come up and get a card and, and stay in touch with us. Thanks. Thanks so Thanks much for coming. Thanks, guys. Tomorrow. Oh, that's right. Tomorrow, if anyone's interested, we're doing a 30th anniversary Temple of Doom panel. So At 2 o'clock in the room next door. Thank <laughs> you.